Welcome, Pewter Report readers and listeners, to another edition of the Pewter Report podcast, energized by Celsius. I am John Ledyard from PewterReport.com, along with me, the one and only Matt Matera, also from PewterReport.com, here with you on a Thursday, ready to wrap up the week for the Pewter Report podcast with a little bit of football talk. Talked to a couple of Bucks coaches today, got some insight into some key battles going into camp i thought we got great insight actually when keith armstrong talks matt special teams coach keith armstrong it's popping in the in the little interview media virtual workroom because he always has some good information to give us it feels like yeah he can take a yes or no question and really stretch it a very very long way i noticed that from the second that he got hired onto the bucks coaching staff great guy very eloquent Um, Gives you a lot of uh, details and analysis that you want to hear as a reporter when you're asking those questions. But yeah, his his press conferences tend to take a little bit longer than other coaches, but that's not a bad thing. Right. No, not a bad thing at all, especially when he's not using just coach speak. He's given us some actual quality information about guys. And one of those guys is Tyler Johnson. We've got to have a we've got to have a heavy conversation on Tyler Johnson today. Uh, yes, you know, we do. And by heavy, I mean, let's spend a few minutes on examining how the adventure it's going to be to get Tyler Johnson onto this active roster in, in the year 2021. We've also got a salary cap number for 2022. Um, and what that's going to impact is going to be on Carlton Davis, on Chris Godwin, on Ryan Jensen, on others. We'll go through the Bucks free agents, look at that situation, look at their cap projected cap space right now for next year. If it is at that 208.2 million mark that we saw announced uh, yesterday, and we're going to do all that on today's show, which is brought to you by our friends over at Celsius. Celsius powers active lives every day with essential functional energy. What you got? Kiwi guava? Yep. Oh, kiwi guava. Great great choice. I'm rocking the blueberry pomegranate. Again, I've gone heat every day this week. I've gone, I would have uh, strawberry dragon fruit. Then I had orangeicle two days in a row. Now today, the blueberry pomegranate rocking the heat. Uh, I'm telling you, man. Blueberry is my favorite. Blueberry pomegranate is a very popular one on the Peter Report staff. I think. Everybody on the staff likes blueberry pomegranate, I'm pretty sure. We also got a lot of it, thanks to our friends over at Celsius. Mm -hmm. You can get a lot of it too, man. Celsius, no sugar, lots of energy, great boost without the drop-off. It's healthy, it's good for you, and it uh, it really helps to start your day with a workout. Man, I'm telling you, it's a great little wake-up call, and the flavor is so good. I can't get over the flavor of Celsius. Absolutely love it. You can check it out for yourself over at Celsius.com. Or by clicking the banner ads over at PeterReport.com, get yourself some Celsius, use that store locator, find out where they are selling Celsius near you. All right, so we know about Tyler Johnson, and what we know is this, Matt. We know that last year he was he flashed, right? We were excited about what we saw from Tyler Johnson, but it was all a wide receiver. We didn't see him play special teams really much at all, and, and Keith Armstrong tells us he was really kind of a – backup special teamer last year and, and and made it a little bit of an adventure with the wide receiver core. Well, now <laughs> you've got an even bigger adventure because you drafted, you traded up to draft a receiver in the fourth round. You've got, you've lost two special teamers in Ryan Smith and Andrew Adams and Justin Watts, who your leading tackler on special teams is also a wide receiver. Scotty Miller is more proven. Antonio Brown is back. Tyler Johnson feels like a man caught in between the wide receivers to play offense and the wide receivers to play special teams. He's not quite good enough to beat out the top four wide receivers. And so he has to play special teams. And and where is his role there? Keith Armstrong said today, didn't really do much for us. Said he was a backup in some roles. A couple games got into some spots. But he said there's no doubt he's going to have to step up his contributions on special teams for this year's team. It's a tall task for him, though. Where does he fit into this? team in 2021 yeah i believe it was you that asked that question more about with justin watson like are they going to keep seven receivers how much does that come into play johnson's in a really 
really tough spot, as you said, where like he's not going to beat out Antonio Brown and guys like that. And, you know, with Ryan Smith moving on, there's an opportunity for all these players on the roster to be like that next up and coming gunner. But when you think of like a gunner on special teams, you, you either think of like the fastest receiver that you have, which isn't Tyler Johnson. He's not mm-hmm. really necessarily known as a right. speed guy to begin with. Then you start thinking about those defensive backs like Chris Wilcox out of BYU. So you don't really see a role for Johnson there. And then you're obviously not going to like put him on the line and you're going to tend to lean towards defensive guys on punt coverage because they're the ones tackling in when there is tackling in practice and training camp. They're the guys making the tackles. You're not going to put a wide receiver that really didn't play too much special teams in college football to come here. You're not going to put them in a role like that. So it's a very difficult spot because I think going into this season before Darden was drafted, you're kind of thinking like, all right, well, there's a chance Antonio Brown can only be here for one more season. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's up in the air with Chris Godwin right now. So you got a good insurance policy going on here with Tyler Johnson, who could eventually step up and be like a number two or number three receiver, given that Scotty Miller, we know his role. He's going to be the deep threat down the field, but Tyler Johnson can bring so many more things to you. But now with Darden getting drafted and you know Brown's going to be here for a whole year and his role is established. I mean, I think Johnson makes the team, but I don't know when he's really going to see the field at all. I don't either. And it's the same situation Keyshawn Vaughn is in, right? I mean, Keyshawn Vaughn's in the same spot. Everybody came back that the the running back position. I mean, McCoy didn't, but then you upgrade from him and and, and Giovanni Bernard. And so it becomes even harder for Keyshawn Vaughn to find his way onto the field. The big difference, of course, being that Vaughn was pretty disappointing as a rookie where Tyler Johnson excited a lot of people. I mean, I think he excited Tom Brady, made some great plays uh, in the red area. I mean, he was, he had a great catch in the playoffs. Um, You know, he, he really, I thought, looked like a receiver in the Chicago game. Remember the catch yeah, and run he had? Right. That was like so, the best post-catch play all year for a Bucs I, I was going to bring that up. So obviously he, he had a very limited role given the talent the Bucs had. Um, he still managed on the season. He had 12 receptions for 169 yards and two touchdowns. But that Chicago game specifically is when he was really asked to do the most as a receiver on this yeah. team. Because Mike, Mike Evans played, but he was like, it was a Thursday night game and he was so hurt from the game before that he was pretty much more of a decoy at that point. Mm-hmm. And um, in that game, he had four receptions for 61 yards, career highs for him. Obviously, he's only in his first year. But when he was asked to play a bigger role, he did step up. And that's why, like you said about Keyshawn Vaughn, where he's in the role, too, as I said before, where, OK, down the road, this looks good. But for the mm-hmm. immediate right now, we don't really know what they're going to get into. Right. And exactly right. We'll talk about that down the road because that's a fascinating part of this whole discussion. Ren wants to know, are you guys saying Tyler Johnson is on the bubble? Come on, man. I'm not necessarily saying that, Ren, but I also think Tyler Johnson can't show up to camp like he's a lock to make the final roster. So if you consider that on the bubble, go ahead and consider that on the bubble. And here's why. It's not even my opinion. I'm very high on Tyler Johnson. It's so just much. basic math. Like, yeah. you know, the top four guys aren't going anywhere. Like the top four guys are the top four guys, you know, the, the, the roles that they play Tyler Johnson. Yes. will get onto the field, even in some type of a, of a rotation potentially with Godwin and or with, uh, with not with Godwin so much, but with Antonio Brown and Scotty Miller, but the top four guys are the top four guys. And Tyler Johnson, if you are the fifth receiver on game days, You've got to play special teams. Like that's what you got to do. And especially if Jalen Darden is the other receiver who is the return guy. So where do you fit in the special teams picture that you can get out on the field? Because that matters. If Justin Watson is the best, Watson is the best special teamer on the in the team on the team going into week one. He's going to get a hat over Tyler Johnson for game days because you have your return guy and your your best special teamer and Justin Watson. I'm not saying Watson will be, right. but Bruce Arians made it clear he's one of their top guys. Said that on the Peter Report podcast. Let him in tackles last year. Really impressed them in that area. If he whoops Tyler Johnson in that area in, in camp, it's it becomes an adventure to figure out how to get Tyler Johnson in the top six. Now, I think they keep seven. I'm not ruling out the fact, and so Tyler Johnson will be fine in that regard. The bigger question to me probably, Ren, is not whether he makes a roster, because I believe that he will make the roster for sure. Bigger question to me is, does he get a hat on game days? How does that, because if he's the seventh guy, and you know, just because of special team, now if somebody gets hurt, Tyler Johnson could jump right in and play 30 snaps. You know, that, that's how it could work. But it's not as simple as just, oh, Tyler Johnson's the fifth best wideout, so he plays. 
Um, that's not that simple when it comes to game day. So you could be looking at, at situations this year where Tyler Johnson, even if he makes the roster, and they keep seven wideouts, something like that because of the talent in the room where he wouldn't necessarily see the field. The other part of this that's interesting, uh, Matt, is that the cornerback battle, which is now, what, five deep or something ridiculous oh, yeah. for CB5, could have huge implications on Tyler Johnson. And I'll explain why here. Because if two of those corners really stand out and you've got, you feel great about keeping maybe six corners instead, and two of those guys are studs, or same thing, the safety battle, right? Raven Green, and you've got so the, the depth battles at safety that, that are happening. If in Javon Hagan, you feel great about keeping two, maybe Javon Hagan and and um and Raven Green, and they're gonna play special teams, and you feel great about that. You feel great about your fifth corner. All of a sudden, now it's like, all right, we have special teams impact coming from other places other than wideout. We don't need Justin Watson. And you feel like you can, boom, Justin Watson's gone. Tyler Johnson's in there. Maybe he plays one or two of the special teams groups, and you feel like you can sneak him in there and survive. Um, that's the path that could have a huge impact on Tyler Johnson, not only the roster, but more likely the, the game day situations for Tyler Johnson of whether he's going to be active or not. Because you already know you're going to have five receivers active on game days if Darden's the return guy, right? And Tyler Johnson's not one of those five. This is, of course, all assuming everybody's healthy. So Tyler Johnson has to be the sixth receiver, not even – I said the fifth earlier. Yeah. Correct me. I, he has to be the sixth receiver because the other five got to be out there if Darden's the return guy. So it gets a, it gets into an adventure for 2021. And what was the emphasis for the Bucs in this draft? It was special teams. Correct. It was all about right. special teams. And it's funny that you brought up the coverage thing too. So now Tyler Johnson is battling against some of the, the DBs and the, and the undrafted DBs. A big thing that Keith Armstrong talked about today is that um, there were certain things he liked about the special teams overall, but one thing he really wanted to improve on was the coverage of their punt team. And again, yeah. that seems like something, and I'm not really trying to bash on Tyler Johnson because, as you said before, you like Tyler Johnson. I like Tyler Johnson too, and I think he's got great potential for this team. But as far as like punt coverage, Tyler Johnson's not the first guy that you know that that comes up for you. I do want to say real quick. To, for Tyler Johnson and a guy like Keyshawn Vaughn as well, I think we all have to remember too that, you know, we see the Justin Jeffersons of the world and guys like that that just light it up on the scene as soon as they enter into the league. And not every single player is like that. And ma namely right. for Tyler Johnson and, and Keyshawn Vaughn is that they haven't gotten to see the field because of who's in front of them. So right. while there's issues right now, let's just keep in mind that these players are still developing and they can, they can be a lot better than we saw last year. And maybe Tyler Johnson puts an emphasis on himself this year that, hey, if I'm going to see the field, it's going to be with special teams. So maybe he goes all out and does the – I mean, you yeah, can only sure. train so much in special teams. But maybe he makes a big jump that we don't expect, and that's a big storyline here in training camp, knowing that we already know who the starters are. So let's see who makes the biggest improvement in a different area. It's all about the team, and the Bucks have done a great job overall of – Drafting character guys, whether it's drafting, mm -hmm. they had multiple team captains that they picked in this year's draft. So they picked the right type of guys that have the mentality that I'm going to get better in any area that I possibly can. Yeah. That's, oh, I'm Tyler Johnson. That's what I'm banking on. Oh, I cannot emphasize enough. It is not about Tyler Johnson. It is about the rest of the wide receiver room. I mean, that's what it's about. It does. Tyler yeah. Johnson could be a top three receiver for most teams in the league. That's I literally believe that about him. I thought that he'd win the Buck slot receiver job last year before Antonio Brown, before Scotty Miller's breakout, obviously before they draft Jalen Darden. Like, you know, that I thought he'd win that job. Then he got hurt, the hamstring going to camp, and you know, there yeah. was a hold up there. All that aside, it doesn't have anything to do with Tyler Johnson. I am I've had a third round grade on Tyler Johnson. I'm a huge I was a huge Tyler Johnson fan. I couldn't believe he fell to the fifth round. Well, I could believe it because yeah, of the, the rumors before the draft, but you know, I predicted the Bucs were going to take him if he was there in the fifth round for them, but the day, the beginning of day three before the round four had even started. Like, I am tied to the guy. Like, there's nothing to do with that. And I'll get to why in a second because the 2022 outlook could be a complete 180 for Tyler Johnson. Jack mm -hmm. says Johnson could see the field when people get hurt. All Evans, Godwin, Brown missed games and were limited due to injury. There's no question, Jack. And this is why I think he will absolutely make the team because. At the end of the day, they love depth at wide receiver, and there's no question. Somebody gets hurt, Tyler Johnson goes from being not wearing a hat on game days to playing a major role on game days. That's the that's the life in the NFL because he is more equipped to play some of those receiver roles. He could, if if it were Godwin, for example, that missed time, wouldn't surprise me if Tyler Johnson outsnaps outsnaps Scotty Miller in the next game. I mean, that's 
that's absolutely on the table. So yeah, I think there's no question that uh, if the injuries happen, we all agree that on that. It, we're talking about if the room is healthy on game days, then it becomes tomorrow. difficult, right? Like how do you get him a hat on game days? If that's the case, you'd almost have to say seven receivers are going to be out there or six, you know, so unless Justin Watson, again, that's going to be the thing, the special teams impact other, uh, other places. Um, somebody said here, let me see if I can find it. I was scrolling through the comments. Ren said, Scotty Miller is more on the bubble than Tyler Johnson. Completely disagree with this. Yeah. Scotty Miller cannot be on the bubble. You don't release guys or have guys on the bubble that make the kind of per catch impact Scotty Miller makes. I mean, per catch values off the charts for right. Scotty Miller this past season. You cannot, you don't even think about, I mean, he's one of the fastest players in the league. Yeah. And opens up everything else for everyone on offense. I mean, yeah. it'd be crazy to get rid of him. Right. Uh, and Mary McGran agrees with that. And he's just saying he's more on the bubble than Johnson. And he thinks Johnson's a lock. And again, like I said, I don't think Johnson's going to get cut. I'm just doing the math in my head, the numbers. They're going to have to like think about seven receivers if he's going to, and he's going to have to prove like I have interest in special teams. I'm not like yeah. going to go out here and think that I'm not going to, you know what I mean? He's got to be aware of that. He's got to have some kind of an impact there. And I'm not saying he has to be a Pro Bowl special teamer, but you have to have an impact for sure. And, um, and if at the end of the day, Watson's way ahead of them, that's going to matter yeah. on game days. The Bucs couldn't even entertain the idea of putting Tyler Johnson on the practice squad because another team would sign him almost right away, I would think. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. Um, even just last year, I mean, he was just – he was straight up good. I mean, yeah, he dropped a couple passes. He messed up a few routes. But, yeah, like you said, rookie, uh, that's going to happen. You know, the think about the plays that he did make. When, what did you say, uh, 12 catches? I mean, we remember most of them, right? <laughs> we do. Well, that's, that's a great and, sign and over a year of hundreds. That he, uh, you know, forced the, the defense to – That's to right. Yeah. In the NFC Championship game. I the remember – from the to, slot, yeah. The dangerous. Bucs have – when they have to have, I don't want to say lower tier guys, but you know, lower guys on the depth chart, they put them in some roles to you know make an opportunity for themselves, and they show that they're not afraid to do that. I, I remember, and I think you and I actually spoke about this on a podcast uh, a while ago. But you know, the Jaden Mickens Monday Night Football game when he played receiver, he, you know, they obviously didn't use Mickens that much on receiver, but yeah. he had a role in that game, and they Bucks have shown that they're not afraid to put guys into elevated roles if if the situation calls for it giants game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I agree with you. Um, it's, you know, again, they love having depth at receiver. Uh, we saw Cyril Grayson was playing for some reason last year. I don't, yeah. <laughs> so there's going to be some type of rotation. You probably won't see Mike Evans hundred percent of snaps every single week. Um, you know, even if he's healthy, so, uh, they'll use all these guys to a degree, obviously, you know, he'll be up 80% of snaps, things like that with Ian Godwin, but you'll, you'll, they'll be able to get him off the field a little bit here. In there. Um, okay, trying to sort through some of the opinions on here. Everybody's got different thoughts, talking about different people. Um, Michael Henderson says, who can sneak onto the practice squad? This is the difficulty, right? Because I don't think – no, I don't know. We don't know the practice squad rules still, right? Because that could determine right. some things. But, again, Justin Watson's not somebody you want to have on the practice squad. Justin Watson, you, he's either out there because he's great at special teams and he's playing, or he's gone. Like, that's it. If you yeah. feel like you can replace him on special teams, he's gone. You know what he is as a wideout. There's no reason to have him on the practice squad. Tyler Johnson and Jalen Darden, you're not getting to the practice squad. So, you know, or Scotty, obviously, you know, not that again, we're not that Scotty being on the practice yeah, squad. Let's is not get <laughs> <not, let's laughs> there. But uh, yeah, I, th yeah. I, I, so I don't think you can get somebody on there. So that's what makes it difficult. It's not, there's no obvious person to kind of push to that direction. You know, I, again, I will see what the rules are. Maybe Jaden Mickens could be there, but you know, that probably we've, we've already rolled him out and he was actually a pretty good kickoff return guy last year, but that's going to obviously be, you know, yeah, that's he, great luxury if, if he's like your backup kick returner, right. assuming that you Darden wins the role, that that's a nice, that's a nice backup to have right there. There's no question about that. And you could stash him on the practice squad and, you know, if another team signs him, so be it. But mm -hmm. yeah, Mickens is definitely, I think, one of the, I guess, top tier options for a, a practice right. squad guy that obviously has a lot of reps being on, on the roster last season. The tricky, the other tricky thing is, so let's say Jalen Darden just bombs the preseason, right? Like he just he's struggling to punt. I know they said today Keith Armstrong was raving about him, and that's a great sign because he's got to be able to catch the ball clean and make very few mistakes in the preseason. You feel confident about him week one, getting a hat, being your return guy. Let's say he bombs the preseason, then you might be looking at a thing where he's inactive on game days, and Antonio Brown's fielding and, and, and taking punts. Your Jaden Mickens is still gone. Darden's inactive. 
AB's handling punts. You're getting Tyler Johnson out there. That's the other path for Tyler Johnson maybe is if Darden can't prove himself as the return guy, but you're not going to cut him and you don't think you can get him onto the practice squad, you know, then Darden's maybe the guy without a hat. And then you've got Antonio Brown taking punts. Tyler Johnson's playing as the fifth receiver and, and, and getting it on special teams along with Watson. I don't know. That's a path, you know, where if, again, if Darden can't handle returns, then, you know, how does he get on the field? How does he factor in everything? Because he's not going to be a top four or five wide receiver, probably definitely not a top four guy, you would think. So how does he get on the field and make an impact if he's not ready to handle returns? Again, we're just going through scenarios. We're not saying Darden won't be ready to handle returns. We're just looking at here's the outcomes, right? Here's the paths to the outcomes that we need to see at receiver because that's where some incredible battles are going to take place over the next couple months. Yeah, absolutely. I think with Darden too, um, it's all about winning in practice. Like if he, if he doesn't make it as far as your scenario of like, if he's dropping punts and things like that, players can prove themselves in practice and he's got a chance to do that as a receiver. Is he going to yeah. take over Scotty Miller's spot? Absolutely not. And Scotty's not going to be on the bubble. Darden's honestly like he's probably the most fascinating guy in my opinion of this draft because his speed is is so interesting and he's got uh, a pretty good ability. He's got a nose for the end zone. Obviously, he scored a, a ton of touchdowns. I believe it was nineteen touchdowns in college football last season, even with like a shortened season, and everything like that. Yeah. I like his potential. He, he's able to break tackles and and make guys miss more than a guy like Jaden Mickens does. I'm really interested. Obviously, he's got his role at, on special teams, but I'm curious if he does get some opportunities, whether it's injuries or, you know, the coach, Coach Aarons one day is like, all right, you know, we're, we're going to even like just a simple screen to him, see if he could just take it to the house. I think mm -hmm. he's a really interesting guy in this draft class because we, we know Joe Tryon's role. He's, he's going to be the third edge rusher, and we haven't even seen him get on the field yet. So, like, who knows how long that could linger for. Right. Uh, Hainsey, offensive line, like the line's already set. Maybe they'll use him on the end of the line. And Trask, obviously, he's a developmental quarterback right now. So Darnett, mm -hmm. out of like the top four picks, I think is arguably the most interesting draft pick that the Bucks have going on right now. You could definitely say that, yeah, because he's going to actually be the one, right? That I mean, assuming he wins that return job, he'll be the one that sees the field, uh, you know, every single game for sure. You know, and again, we assume Tryon will be healthy enough, and he'll get out there too as the number three guy. You know, but let's say, you know how teams do with rookies sometimes. They're like, oh, this guy hasn't played since 2019. Let's ease him in. Anthony yeah. Nelson will be the number three guy for the first four weeks. And then even though Tryon's obviously better, we'll make him the number three guy. That could happen. You know what I mean? We're saying that could happen and not saying that it will. And But also, Barrett and JPP don't come off the field a lot, right? So there's – so like you said, it really could – Darden could – it's not a high – it's not crazy to think he could have the bigger impact of the rookie class this season uh, depending on how much Tryon gets to see the field or if they – split his role with somebody else or something like that. So um, so uh, this is a good question from Vortex. Where do you guys think Darden eventually plays in our offense? He doesn't fit the Bruce Arians type slot guy, but he's probably best in the slot. Do you think he plays on the outside? I think he plays on the outside some, but also in the slot. I think he's kind of a hybrid Scotty Miller, Antonio Brown type of player. <laughs> this is why. Here's why I think this. I think that – in the Byron Leftwich expansion of the offense that seems to be happening, the Byron Leftwich, because remember, we do say Bruce Arians type, and that does matter because Leftwich and him have similar minds on things like the Godwin and the Johnson types. But I do think Byron Leftwich is adding in kind of this, okay, let's, let's have this quick game passing attack that Bruce Arians is definitely not known for but seems very open to. Yeah. And let's get the ball out. Right? Tunnel screens with Godwin, quick hitters to AB on these bubbles. Let's do that kind of stuff. I think Darden's going to be able to play inside and do some of that stuff eventually. That's that's the vision, at least. We'll see whether that happens because this room is loaded. Uh, or And I think he's also, when they start cutting down the splits for the receivers, they bring everybody in a little bit tighter to the line of scrimmage. They, they, they reduce those splits, and they stack those, those stack formations. I think Darden will be kind of like the Z receiver off the line of scrimmage so he can't get pressed, and he'll release on some vertical routes very similar to how they use Scotty Miller. You think of the touchdown against Green Bay before the half, a bunch of big play, big play against the Chargers um, in, in that second half and week three, you know, same thing. They're reducing a split. They get him vertical on a clean release with the with the stacked receiver, the point uh, running point kind of off the line of scrimmage, taking the jam and getting that guy a clean release. That's, I think, the long-term goal with Jalen Darden, that he could be somebody that like a little post-catch action, a little vertical action, not much intermediate work. 
that's kind of, I think, what they feel like is the long-term goal with Darden. Yeah, I'm glad you compared him like a little bit to Scotty and a little bit to Antonio Brown. Specifically with Brown, I mean, you look at the Bucks' offense right now, and you know, like Mike's going to be on the outside, and, and Chris kind of has that that slot role that everyone's been talking about for years. And Antonio Brown obviously can play outside, but he kind of like just moves all throughout, uh, you know, the, the offense for the Bucs. I mean, even look at like the the touchdown he had in the Super Bowl and the way he was lined up, and it's just like a quick little. Yep. You know, shot to the end zone right there. And I see that with Jar- uh, with Darden too, just because, you know, he's so fast that he can hopefully separate and stretch the defense kind of like Scotty Miller does. But I think it, I think it would not be wise to just put him in a box. Not that, not that they put Scotty Miller in a box, but like Scotty Miller clearly excels at just beating right. people down, down the field. And if you can stay with him, good for you. Darden, I think he's a little more versatile and he's able to do so many different things. Why limit it to just outside or just mm-hmm. in the slot? Why not move him around? I think that makes the offense so much more dynamic than it already is. And it's already an extremely talented and dynamic offense as it is. Right. It will be very – I just can't wait to see. Is Darden even going to be able to see the field? Do they have packages for him? Do they become too predictable early on at least when they put him out there? Does he play in the backfield some? Um, does they do some of that – Stuff like they tried to use Scotty a little bit last year and yeah, some of those screen cool. games. And you know what I mean? They'll like run them that orbit motion and they throw it out to him in the flat with a head of steam. And not really as fast as he is, not really his skill set with the ball in his hands. Right. You know, he if there's space, he might take it, but that's about it. He's not a creator. And Jalen Darden certainly they see him as more of a creator as a more return guy. Yeah, guy. yeah, exactly. Uh, and, the, and they've talked a ton about what is his body, right? They've talked about. He's thick. He's bigger. You know, he's got mm-hmm. a bigger frame than Scotty. I think Bruce Aarons even said after that OTA the other day or the rookie mini camp. And so that's going to be part of it, right? Is 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 if they feel like Darden can handle that kind of a load, maybe he gets some reps by the end of the year. But again, all of this just kind of leaves Tyler Johnson's role in much more of a quant- if everybody's healthy. You poor know, Tyler where's the game day role? Like I know, literally, like poor Tyler Johnson. Because let's transition this to 2022, Matt. Like. You're looking at a situation where Tyler Johnson could be in year two, despite a good rookie season, struggling to get a hat and get on the field and contribute at all on game days. And in some people's eyes, just kind of barely making the roster, right? If you're one of those inactive on game days, you're hanging on. Then yeah. next year, if Godwin leaves and Antonio Brown's a free agent again too, and you know, I just I, he could be your wide receiver too. I mean, that's literally, and they could feel good about it. I mean, that's yeah. it's a it's because the room is so loaded. It's that weird of a situation, and that's why I think more because of 2022 than anything in 2021, I just don't think you can let him go. you got to find a way. If it means keeping seven receivers, if it means you tell Justin Watson to kick rocks and you're worse on special teams and you just count on offense making up for it, I mean, I know it's replacing a lot on special teams with with some of the other guys that you lost too. I know that's that's asking a lot, and fans overlook that part of it, but that it's asking a lot, but you just can't let Tyler Johnson go because he could have a big impact for this team down the road. Not that I think Godwin's going to leave or you know, long term. I think this team will resign him, and we'll talk about that in a second. But I I think Tyler Johnson's future outlook to me is still really strong, even if this year looks super bleak. I agree with that. It, it's so funny just to think the situation that the Bucks will be in next year with free agency. It's very similar to what it is right now. Thankfully, for the benefit of the Bucks, the salary cap is going to be much higher. And I said this in the in the article when we posted it that um, the salary cap going up is good for everyone across the NFL, but it's especially great for the Bucks. I mean, this team could look so I don't want to say so so different, but this team could look quite different next season when you look at the number of free agents that uh, that are off the books this year. It's Gronk, Godwin, Leonard Fournette, Dom Sue, Ryan Jensen, Alex Kappa, Kappa, Rojo, Carlton Davis, and JPP. I mean, those yeah. are some heavy hitters and big time players for this team that are a huge reason why they won the Super Bowl. But like you said, I'm I'm not that I want to see Chris Godwin leave. And obviously, if they could bring back Godwin and Tony Brown, that'd be great. Yeah. I feel and a lot will we'll have to see in training camp and, and the season this year, and we'll see how Darden develops too. But I feel pretty good if Tyler Johnson is the number two receiver. After this season, and who knows? Maybe Darden plays great too, and he jumps it and gets into the you know number two. But this is all hypothetical right now, and I don't want to yeah. start building the lineup so far away. We haven't even seen this, season. right? But yeah, hypothetically, you'd be looking at a top four next year that would be obviously Mike Evans, Scotty Miller, 
and then you'd have Jalen Darden and, and you'd have the Tyler Johnson in there. And that would be kind of what you're looking at if nobody comes back. So that's your worst case scenario for the Bucs. There are worse scenarios for sure. Uh, I think seeing how Darden Johnson developed this year is huge, though. I mean, hopefully we get a chance to actually see Johnson develop at something. Um, but that, yeah, that's big. They're they're going to have to really be on evaluating all that because it becomes a cost efficiency thing. And we're going to talk about that in literally a moment. But first, want to let you know about Locker Room. It's a social audio app that is changing the way we talk sports. It's the only place for live audio conversations about the takes, rumors, news, and teams you care about. React to sports news as it happens, gather all your friends and watch parties for the biggest games, rep your favorite teams, and find your community. Better Sports Talk is just a tap away, download on the Apple App Store, and join the conversation with Locker. And we were live last night. We had some good little chat in between the Penguins, uh, our Penguins, our Penguins, Matt, getting yeah. ousted from the playoffs due to the – I mean, what do you even say, man? Like – I shouldn't even talk about this in the podcast. Yeah, the fans don't want to hear this. I'm going to be so mad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Big, big, big shout out to the Lightning, though. Big shout out to the Lightning. Yeah, great win for Lightning. Wrapped up yeah. the series last night. A shout yeah. out, I believe. Yep. I, yeah. I hope they I hope they go all the way again, man. I would man. love it. I, I really have always enjoyed that team, and I hate the rest of the East with a passion. So uh, I would love to see them go all the way. So um, uh, so they a uh, locker room. Are you and Taylor on there tonight, or is Taylor too – What is is he saying he's too cool for that now? <laughs> he's moved on to yeah, Plant man, City. Got a big job. Wow. With, uh, the plant. wow. All right, Taylor. I, know, I got a schedule, but we will be on again quite soon. Okay. All right. Okay. If he, I didn't know if he was still doing those. Do you thought he was just too cool for us now? But uh, so yeah, check out Taylor and Matt when they're on there. And again, just follow, download Locker and follow uh, Pew Report on there, and you'll get notified when they go live. And we always have really fun football conversation on there for sure. Um, yes, this cap situation. So the NFL announced yesterday. The cap ceiling for 2022, Matt, is 208.2 million, which is up 10 million from the 2020 cap, which was 198.2 million. That was released, obviously, right before COVID happened. Then this past year it goes down, what, to 182? 182.5. Okay, yeah. yeah. So now it's going from 198.2 to 182.5. Now back all the way up to 208. Point. So Usually they're trying to go what up ten million a year. Yeah, they went that, that down. was a projection every single year and up until COVID. Okay, happened. so now they're kind of just saying pretend last year didn't happen. We're still at one ninety eight. We're going up ten million from one ninety eight. Players are like, well, it should be two hundred eighteen million now, really. Right. But but they'll settle for it. Uh, it gets them back on track. My, it's a fourteen percent jump. My guess is you'll see another big jump, bigger than ten million, maybe even to get them closer to being back on the track that they were for 2023, which would suggest to me that if this trajectory continues, I don't think it's crazy to envision a cap of like two, 225 million in 2023. So not next off season, but the next off season. I know people are like, why are they talking about that off season that far off? Here's why the bucks have a million free agents again, yeah. this off season, Matt, you mentioned it. Chris Godwin, Carlton Davis, Ryan Jensen, those are the biggest names that highlight the list. But obviously you've got the one-year guys, the Rob Gronkowski's, what's going to happen with him, one more year of him maybe. Jason Pierre-Paul might be one more year of him. Um, it, it, maybe you could say that with Will Golston too just because they probably lose Sue to retirement and and there may be some you know desire to keep a little more stability ability in that group mcclendon same thing to lose him to retirement maybe you don't lose three guys so maybe goals to the one-year guy um what's oj howard's situation like what's ronald jones situation like probably not gonna be in tampa but they got three running backs that'll be free agents you want to bring somebody back is geo the guy you bring back because you can replace the other roles a lot easier with a rookie uh in just the pure running game that's how i'd look at it alex kappa is, has earned his way into a bigger contract we haven't even mentioned Antonio Brown, who could legitimately be a top 20 receiver in the league again this year. Obviously, he's the number three in Tampa Bay, so you can afford to probably let him go. But Jordan Whitehead, you know, so there's a lot of players. I think there's some replaceable players that will be up. But again, we got to see how this year unwinds. It's going to say a lot about, you know, a guy like O.J. Howard and some of those these players and see what their ceiling is. So all of this to say the 2023 cap matters because – it can allow the Bucks to push a little bit more money down continually the down the road because, again, we've seen now that it's jumping up to 208, uh, they're not going to get hurt that bad for, for the money they pushed down the road already. They can push a little bit more if they feel like they're still in that window again 
uh, to be able to win. Because remember, contracts come off the books then after 2023 and you open up a ton of space. So they right now they're at about 280. Right now, one 186 is about their projected cap for 2022 where they'd be at. So they've got about 21, 22 million in cap space. Take Cam Brate's contract out of there because it's going to get restructured if he's still there. You know, that's that clears that you know, he and he and, and Rakeem Nunes Roches clear up about 10 more mil. You obviously know the team can move money around with players and, and restructure. They didn't even touch Marpet's contract, and you can easily restructure and find yourself a lot of money there if you wanted to. So again, there's ways to kind of do this thing, but the Bucks are in a good spot for, for 2022, and I think 2023 could be pretty open book for them they hardly have anybody under contract for 2023 so if you could push some money there and, and extend some people and just straight up extend people and not really worry about it just lower those year one cap hits so it's not just going to be about next year's cap it'll be about the long-term cap too yeah i was gonna say i, I think you could see uh some extensions coming down is it coming down the pipe or coming down the pike it doesn't matter either way you could see some extensions coming both, down both maybe i've heard of both yeah, ways. I, I feel like yeah you could you could get away with both uh, anyway, so would you like, in my opinion, who are your like top three, you know, free agents that the Bucks need to re-sign? Because I definitely have Carlton Davis one and Godwin two. I'm leaning towards, I'm leaning towards Jensen three because he was just such a great center for this team. But then and obviously they just drafted Hainsey and it's like they could groom him and he was, he was playing yeah. center in the rookie minicamp and, and OTAs. I, I'm just curious to get your take on that. I would agree with you completely, I think. Um, I want to see how Carlton plays this year, whether I put him one or two, but yeah. it's pretty scary right now for me to think about that secondary without Carlton. So, I mean, again, value, 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 valuable position, valuable role because of how much he marks the other team's best player. That's not easily replaceable. And when your other corners are question marks, <laughs> Carlton Davis is one of the most valuable players in the box, in my opinion, right now. Uh, because right. Like, I, I think you can you can replace like a slot corner like SMB, you know, mm-hmm. whether through the draft or maybe you get like a, a veteran guy. Like even Ross Cockrell played a, a good role. Mm-hmm. You know, SMB was struggling and things like that. So like he's definitely replaceable. I think uh the OJ Howard situation is so interesting for this year because it, it, it sucked that he got hurt and it sucks that he has this injury history about him because it still feels like there's meat on the bone when it comes to OJ Howard, where it's like, yeah, you can do without him, but there's that other side of the fence where it's like, man, if he does tap into that potential and it's on another team mm-hmm. missing out on him. And I find JPP situation really interesting too, because Agreed. if he plays at the same level that we've seen over the past two or three seasons, I think the Bucs absolutely, I shouldn't say need, but the, he's a guy that you really should bring back because there's no guarantee that Tryon's just going to be like the real deal this year. The Bucs have had a great history over the past couple of seasons um, hitting on these first round picks, but it's never a guarantee. Everyone always says the draft is, is a crap shoot to begin with. I think having that security of JPP back again, I yep. think it's a really interesting situation. A lot of this kind of just, comes down to how these guys perform. Like, what if Jensen starts progressing this year? It's like, all right, well, that's right. Cut our bait now instead of signing him to a big deal, and then he regresses, you know, midway into the contract, depending on how long that deal would be. A lot I'm just of face situations here. Yeah, I'm guessing exactly what you said about Jensen is the hold up right now. I think just the way he plays the game. Brandon Thorne was on yesterday. If you miss it, great podcast with him. He had a lot of, of light to shine on the Bucks offensive line. They're playing his eyes where he sees them kind of going. He thinks. Jensen, even as a big Jensen advocate, he thinks Jensen's the best center in the league, but he thinks Jensen could be headed for decline at some point. He said maybe one more year, really good year. Then you probably look at a decline, maybe at a guy like that is just guessing, maybe not, but the way he plays the game, the physicality that he plays the game with, um, the body is going to kind of break down at some point. He's been actually very consistent. He's barely missed any playing time over the last four years. Brandon was saying he might have played more snaps than any other center in the league. So you've got that going for him. That matters to the Bucks too. But then you look at things and you're like, okay, age. And we're trying to figure all these things out. And Jensen's, what, 31 or going to be 31 this season, I think. So it's like, okay, how do we gauge that? I will say this. I think guys that, you know, like an Alex Kappa is young and, and improving. And if he continues to get better this year, he's going to be a guy that you just – I wouldn't even really consider maybe. Like that, that guy's going to earn like a nice contract. We see some of these chump O-linemen 
get paid a lot of money when they hit them. And, and Kappa is going to get paid a lot of money. So I just think, you know, at his age, you're, you're just, you know, go with, go with God type of situation. And yeah. now you're looking at the rest of the line and trying to figure out where you want to replace. That was another thing I wanted to bring up real quick too, is the Bucks got a huge benefit of, you know, when you re-sign a guy like Levante David, you know, he wants to be here and yeah. he didn't necessarily take a discount, but like you knew he wanted to be back here. You, you know, Chris Godwin wants to be back here. You knew mm -hmm. Shaq wanted to be back here. Eventually one of these players is going to take a bigger contract somewhere else because he, the Bucks are successful and they're going to throw that money at him. And I don't blame that player at all whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But as much as these guys love each other, eventually one of them is going to take the bag somewhere else. Not to their fault, but eventually yeah. it's got to – I mean, the run the Bucks are on with re-signing all these guys, eventually – Oh, yeah. Somewhere. To, to me, like the guys like Kappa and Whitehead, I mean, you're going to get starting money somewhere else, and the Bucks should just not be throwing starting money at a player like Jordan Whitehead. And somebody else will throw that money. I mean, assuming he plays again – this year, like he did last year, he's a good player. He can start in the NFL, but he's replaceable. You got to be able to replace guys like that. You, you know, that's this is the off. Same with the running backs, like your Leonard Fournette, Ronald Jones. I'm not worried about them after this year. You know, you're, I'd love to bring back Geo, um, finish out his career. You know, that role, I think. But again, we're getting obviously way ahead of ourselves. But the OJ Howard thing is big to me because, like you said, let's say OJ Howard. What best case scenario with OJ Howard? He has a lot of 500 yard season this year with the talent that they have there. I mean, some injuries happen, maybe he gets a few more, but best case scenario, he stays healthy. He's probably looking at like a 500 yard season, you know, um, that might be enough to get him a contract somewhere else, but with his injury history and this offense being perfect for him and playing one more year with Brady, remember what he had to say about Brady last off season, like just the way he talked about him was like, Brady's the biggest difference maker I've ever been around. Like for me personally, as a player, like the way he brings me along. He loves Tom Brady. I mean, he might love Tom Brady more than anybody else on that team. He, the way he talks about him, man, last year, every time we got a chance to talk to him, he was just glow up. And remember, that confidence thing's big for OJ. I wonder if he would be like a guy that would take a one year deal. You know, like, wait, let's, I, I had the 500 yard, I had like a nice step in the right direction. I still have this injury history, like behind me. I've got to put some distance on it. Uh, let me take another one year, prove it type of deal with Tampa Bay, and then we'll go see what's out there. But the other side of, side of the coin is he plays a position that's, there's just not a lot of good tight ends laying around the league, Matt. So well, that might give him a price. He's in a bit of a tightrope situation because what if Gronk plays this year and then he's like, all right, I had a good career, I'm done, and Correct. he retired. Then you're yeah. looking at you have Cam Brady as your number one, and you don't really, you know, you have McElroy and Tanner Hudson. Mm -hmm. are, are those really suitable backup tight ends that you're confident in, like going into the next season? No. Mm -hmm. So then the the negotiations of that whole situation would be quite interesting because the Bucks need OJ, but you don't want to overpay for him at the same time. It could get quite dicey in the mm -hmm. tight end room. It could be. There, there is a lot of question marks about that room if Gronk doesn't come back, I think, for another year. You know, he's going year to year. Uh, I think he will play another year, but if he wouldn't, then it's like, oh, is OJ Howard our number one guy? Is he going to do the blocking we just got from Gronk, or should we just get a blocker? You know, should we, should we just go that route for cheap and yeah. we get, you know, we keep Cam Bray to catch the ball? And I, you know, I don't know, but. Um, it, yeah, this is going to be some interesting conversations to be had around that position group for sure. Um, so there'll be lots to, to, to look at, but the bottom line is this, if they want to bring people back, I believe that the fact that the cap is going to jump at a higher rate than it, than it once was, you know, the that will go to probably, if I'm guessing 225, something like that, or 223 and not just 218, I think it gives them more flexibility to push some money down the road especially because they have so little on the books for those years. And we are talking about older players, right? We're talking about guys like a lot of these guys are one-year deals. I mean, Golston's, the JPPs, like those guys are probably one-year deal types, the Gronks. Um, so it, it gives you some ability to play with money for those one-year contracts where normally you would just be like one-year contracts are tough. Like if you want a one-year at a high rate, it's tougher. Now the Bucks have some flexibility they didn't have before, especially if the cap keeps jumping up. So, uh, yeah, lots, lots to discuss um, for sure. Um, but yeah, and a good point here. First is tragedy says, well, whoa, now that's preseason all pro Tanner Hudson that we're talking about. So um, that's true. Al also wants to know, did you feel conf Do you feel confident about sliding Edwards into a starting safety spot? Would that be a draft or free agency replacement? I think you would play Antoine Winfield more at strong safety, Mike Edwards more at free safety, and you draft somebody mid rounds or, or sign a, guy cheap that could be your third safety that'd be my thoughts 
yeah, Bruce Arians calls Mike Edwards a, a ball hawk, and we saw him make big plays in the postseason and, and throughout mm-hmm. the year. So I, I'd be really interested to see him in a starting role, see how many PBUs and INTs he can get in a in a full starters position. Yeah. Charles wants to know, could the Bucks move on from Will Golston? Um, he would be a free agent. He would be 31, I believe. Uh, JPP, by the way, will be 33. So something to consider with all those guys. JPP's cap hit would have to come down from what it is now. What is it now? It's, I mean, it's something wow. significant anyway. But it, it would have to come down, and then you would be looking at a situation where how much he wants to play. JPP said at least he wants to play a while longer. You know, Golson probably easier to get him for cheap. You know, for four mil because the production's not going to be there. I don't think he'll have this huge market. Uh, JPP would have a market. You know, yeah. he might get a two-year deal, but again, that's a guy with a significant injury history that's going to be 33 years old in January. <laughs> that's that's tricky to pay, you know, um, at any position. If we'll yeah. see, if he stays healthy all year. 12.8 million this year. Okay, so that's a lot. That's a yeah. lot. Um, you'd have to have that number come down pretty pretty decent to to bring back JP. I, uh, JPP, I would think, especially on a one year. Will Golston should be easy to bring back on a one year. And answer to your question, Charles. The only question would be to me is if he feels like he doesn't want to take a one year or wants to go somewhere else or wants to retire. I don't know. Um, yeah. You know, not that he's that old, but that could be something that's on the table for sure. All right, so that covers kind of the bases a little bit with with uh, some of these guys uh, in terms of thinking about. Somebody said, "What number would we be comfortable with for Ryan Jensen?" Um, what's he making now? Ten. So yeah, right on that, let me double check here. But that's why it gets tricky with Ryan Jensen. He is age is kind of in the in between right now. He's like the 30, 31. You could get two, three more years out of him at good years, but you don't want to pay him 10 mil. So he's got to be less than that. Um, I, I would think eight would be the number that, that's in my head. But yeah, he's maybe, at right now. Right. Yeah. He could get at the market. Somebody else could give him 10. Yeah. And if he, thinks that he himself is the best center in the league, like many people do, then yeah, he should feel mm-hmm. he should get paid what he's worth. All right. And yeah, so he'll be a tricky one because his career is kind of teetering. He was a late bloomer, right? Compared to some of these other guys who are best. So his, the next contract for him is a little bit trickier to figure out because of that. Where does the league view him um, compared to that? How much do they even value the position? Um, you know, his consistency and longevity on the field is good, but, the flip side of things, his age indicates that he could maybe be headed for some type of decline and they don't want to pay him anything big. So the other part of this is that I think Jensen really loves the run game and the Bucs aren't a running team, obviously. And that could, you know, he could be like, I want to finish out my career just leaving it all on the line for somewhere like back in Baltimore, Tennessee or something, you know, something like that. Like just grinding it out on the ground and (laughs) not having to worry about pass pro or whatever, like most, like most linemen think, I believe. Um, so that's something that will be something to, to consider with him too. So there you go. We've covered kind of some of the bases there. And before we uh, head out today, though, I did want to let people know to check out our friends over at Briar Greaves Insurance. I, Mark would get after me if I didn't remind you all to check out our friends over at Briar Greaves. You don't stay in business for over 30 years if you aren't doing something right. Briar Greaves does a lot of things right, but none more than giving exceptional personal service to their insurance customers. We all need insurance, whether it's life, homeowners, auto, or even commercial insurance. Briar and Sam Greaves and their staff are the best in the area and big bucks fans. It will literally take you 10 minutes to get a quote or compare your current policy. And that 10 minutes could turn into hundreds of dollars in savings. Don't wait. Call Briar Greaves today at 813-876-4166 and find out how much money you can put back in your pocket. 30 years in the business and bucket season, bucks season ticket holders Call Briar or Sam today. That brings us to the point in the show, Matt, where we got to talk about what happens next week. And then we got to talk about our friends over at Manscaped. So I just wanted to give you that little heads up to prepare yourself, obviously, for people in the chat. Don't go anywhere because we are going to talk about our friends over at Manscaped as we always do. But first, Matt, uh, next week on the show, we've got what? An OTA? Uh, is that you and I? Are we yeah, going out to the OTA? Yeah, that's right. All right. Let's get All it, right, baby. Let's go. Tuesday, oh. OTAs on the field. Yeah, excited oh, yeah. excited for it. Uh, we got players uh, that we'll talk to, I think, that day at some point, maybe. Maybe not in person because that's still not a thing somehow. Well, but we'll talk with the coach in person. But. Talk with the coach in person, yes. Try to get on Zoom while we're there to talk to players that walk past us. Um, and then we will, uh, from there, kind of go through the rest of the week. We'll have some guests lined up. We're working on that right now. Scott, 
TBD. I mean, could we get that voice back? Today was today was not, did not make the kind of progress we hoped for for Mr. Reynolds. Mm -hmm. So uh, Scott trying to come back from the laryngitis. Um, I think we're hopeful for Monday, uh, but right now I would say he's questionable to return. Would be how I would designate Scott Reynolds. Hey, Matt, this is your pubic service announcement and the news you've all been waiting for. The Manscaped engineering team has confirmed that they have successfully created the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, which is now available for purchase in the USA and Canada. It was released, well, more than a few moments ago, but we have been one of the first to get our hands on it, Matt. That part is not a lie. That is not an over-exaggeration. We were one of the first, and it is terrific stuff. Stuff you can join over two million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you: twenty percent off and free worldwide shipping with the promo code Pewter P E W T E R at Manscaped.com. We've been one of the first people to try the 4.0. The craftsmanship and details are terrific. Ceramic blades, skin safe technology. Looks like something Elon Musk's engineers worked on. That's how good this is. Uh, multi-function on off switch can engage a travel lock. So it's not going off in your backpack, running the battery down. Actually, that's kind of a clutch function. Not going to lie <laughs> as yeah. somebody who's had that happen with razors before. Uh, it also gives you the ability. There's a 4,000 K led spotlight for a more precise shave. Wow. They're really lighting it up down there. Uh, and that you can customize your trimmings with guard lengths. One size is one through four, two toned mat, got the manscaped logo and it's waterproof wireless charging. I mean, it's a game changer. You can get 20% off plus free shipping with the promo code pewter, P-E-W-T-E-R at manscaped.com. Make sure you check that out. Yes. Yes. My people, it is at manscaped with the promo code pewter. Hey, listen, father's day's coming up. That's all I'm saying. Tell people what you want. Tell people about the promo code and the 20% off. Uh, and it could be a game changer for you for sure. All right, Matt, the bucks, had no OTAs, a little bit more uh, a chance for us to see uh, practice squad and 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 special teams eligibility, and we might and not get Giovanni much. Bernard. What's that? And Giovanni Bernard. And Giovanni Bernard and Anthony Nelson, maybe. Um, but then mini camp is around the corner too, and we're we're geeked for that. I mean, that's going to be June seventh through 9th. We we'll have lots of great coverage of that going on over at PeterReport.com, both written and podcast form. It's exciting time to be a Bucks fan and to see how this roster is going to take shape. We're excited to be breaking it down with you. Another great week. We appreciate you all joining us for John Ledyard and for Matt Matera. Thanks so much for listening to another edition of the Pewter Report podcast. Out. Out.